So, Ken, it's been really now 10 years, and you have listened to most of the debates, and I'm wondering how you would be writing now if you were writing these books, which of these points have really undermined or shaken or severely qualified any of the general theses that you put forward at that time? I mean, I think the most important point that has held up relatively well is the claim that the divergence in living standards is pretty late, that it's not 16th century, it's not even 17th century, that it's probably post-1750. Right. And I think the reason why that's <clears throat> an important point is that if that's true, certain very broad brush explanations that we've had of why the West rather than China just don't hold up. So for instance, if, as some people claimed, um, the Chinese state crushed property rights and therefore you had no incentive to um, be productive, well, if that were true, then the divergence would have appeared much earlier than 1750. Mm. Or some of the other explanations, <clears throat> you know, such as that um, Confucianism did not encourage you to try to tinker with nature and encourage you to accept it. Right? Again, that's a very broad brush explanation. Mm. And if that had been true, it would be hard to explain why as late as 1750, the standard of living difference is, I think, still quite small. And that part, I think, has held up. And I think what that does then is push us towards, first of all, towards narrower explanations. Um, and there, I think, some of the narrower explanations I've proposed have held up better than others, but we can get to that in a minute. Right. But the other thing I think it does, which is really quite important, is to suggest that we rethink the dichotomy in which we say, the West succeeded, China failed. And here, I mean, it's a funny, funny thing that I think in certain ways I was subconsciously influenced by some of Patrick's work without quite realizing it. Because part of what Patrick had done in an earlier phase of his career, along with people like Nick Crafts, was to look at the comparison of England and France, which in an earlier generation had been phrased very much in that. England succeeded, why did France fail? Mm. And essentially to say, well, let's reframe this. OK, France industrializes a few decades later. Um, its agriculture takes a little bit longer to become productive, etc. But in the great scheme of things, France follows England into modern sustained growth reasonably quickly. So rather than always asking what was wrong with France, you know, maybe we should see it as part of a Europe that did reasonably well. And I think in some sense, though it took me a while to realize I was doing this, I was saying the same thing, not about all of China, but at least about coastal China. And also, I would say, about even more affirmatively about Japan. So that it's part of it becomes a question of scale. If you look on a certain scale, being a few decades later to do something is a huge retardation. Mm. If you look on a different time scale or a different spatial scale, right? Yeah. I mean, I was very struck when we had a meeting about the Great Divergence at Oxford a few years ago. And after we'd spent the whole day talking about China versus Europe back and forth in various ways, David Washbrook, the distinguished South Asianist, had one of the last comments. And he said, you know, I've been listening to this all day. And part of what strikes me is how, from the perspective of South Asia, the two ends of Eurasia look much more like each other than either of them looks like the place I study. And I think in some ways that kind of reframing mm. was as important to what I was trying to do as the specific, um, you know, as the specific arguments. But of course it hinges on the empirical detail because if you don't accept the claim that living standards are still pretty close in 1750, mm. then it's harder to make the case that as viewed over the long haul or as viewed from a third perspective, China and Europe are less different than we've been trained to think. But what do you both say, both of you, because you're both involved with this, that there is now quite a fundamental critique which says that living standards uh, between China uh, and 
and England are still very wide apart between northwestern mm -hmm. Europe. Uh, they're much closer to the poorest parts of Europe. I mean, that's where the that's where the empirical debate has now gone, is it not? Well, I think does that does, does that undermine your views at all, or do, you know, the Anxi Delta and Italy? That, okay, we'll buy that one, mm -hmm. but the Anxi Delta and England, no, we won't buy that one. I well, mean, I, I think in living standards, actually, it still is reasonably persuasive. There's a, I mean, where I think we've seen a difference is that wages move ahead in Northwestern Europe much sooner than they do in the Lower Yangtze. Yeah. But remember, the wage-earning population is probably close to half of the English population by the 18th century. Yeah. It's barely 10% of the population of the Lower Yangtze, and tenant farmers are earning you know, two and a half to three times as much as wage laborers and smallholders still more than tenant farmers. So I would say that I think in terms of living standards, things are still pretty close. Now, clearly that wage difference does <clears throat> matter, and it causes us to think about things like, well, maybe the average Chinese is keeping up with Europeans in part because he's giving up less of his product to the wealthy. Right, so there might be a difference at the top of society that we need to look at more. And my book is very much looking, you know, trying to look mostly at the bottom. At the bottom. Yeah. So that, I think, is an important critique. And I think some of the work that people like Phil Hoffman and Peter Linder have done suggesting that, well, maybe the poor aren't that far apart, but that the European rich are a good deal richer. I think is persuasive. Or the middle class in Europe is much larger as a proportion of the population. And that I'm not as sure of. Uh, and another uh, problem is, I think the previous uh, scholarship based on the insufficient studies of uh, living standards of China or Europe, very, not very deep, in particular China, even in the eastern part of China, uh, so far, we have not have very detailed research about about the consumption of food, grass. So, if we just um, uh, conclude uh, the China's living standards maybe just uh, equal some uh, parts of Europe, I think. This conclusion is not very solid if we don't have a, a deep research. For example, um, after uh, Pem uh, Professor Pemmerans publi published his uh, book of Great Divergence, and uh, he's the first person who make a comparison of living standards of China and uh, Europe, I followed. I did a case study of food consumption and grass consumption of the, some part of China. And the, the conclusion is surprising. Um, the nutrition situation is much bet and better than we thought and uh, reached the modern standards, of course. As we mentioned, it's just a part of China. China, China is a countryside uh, country, and uh, the divergence within China even greater. But the first thing we should take each region of China and make a very uh, deep uh, studies. Then we can. Uh, make a study of whole country, then we can make a comparison with the whole Europe. The, that conclusion will be much more convincing. Yeah, I think that's a very important point. And we have to remember the enormous divergences within both China and Europe. And the Yangtze Delta looks more like the Netherlands or England, Gansu looks more like the Balkans. 
And so we have to be very, very careful not to just take the national state as a unit and immediately assume that that's what we should be comparing. Of course, Absolutely. the problem is the data tends to come in national units, it does, yes. and that makes things hard. Actually, not just leaving standards. I just follow Professor uh, Pomerantz. Uh, many years ago, I published uh, my book about uh, agriculture mm. in Yangtze Delta. And uh, years ago, uh, some scholar in the Netherlands told me, um, I read your book. If you take all names of places or persons and change in the Dutch one, we can see it's the Netherlands, not a, a, a China. So um, the similarity is so rich, uh, but we didn't know. Uh, recently, I and my uh, co-author uh, and my colleagues in Netherlands, we try to use the same methods, same uh, kinds of materials to restruct uh, the GDP in the beginning of 19th century. And the conclusion also is surprising. The, uh, very close. Uh, I mean, the national income per capita, and the economic structure, and urbanization, and uh, employment, and uh, uh, the wealth distribution, quite similar. So Professor De Vries said, um, Netherlands can be seen the first modern economy in the world. Why the Yangtze Delta not? Yeah. So, I think all thing if we put the comparison within the framework of global history, it's much easier to understand. Yeah, I think one of the other things that comes out of that is that it's very different to be a prosperous, reasonably successful early modern economy and to become an industrial economy. And I think both in the Marxist tradition and in the sort of modernization theory tradition in the West, there was an assumption that once you had the institutions in place and you were accumulating capital, et cetera, somehow the transition to the industrial world would just happen. And I think something that we all share is the sense that actually that's a very problematic transition, right? And it's not just that if you have the markets, everything will follow. In some ways, the interesting question is not so much why did cert certain places fail to industrialize, but why did any place industrialize? Um, I mean, it's a very peculiar thing to have made this transition to a radically different way of living, um, radically different levels of energy use, um, people doing different things for a living, right? people moving out of agriculture, which have been the primary human occupation for millennia, and that one shouldn't expect that to follow smoothly simply from the fact that you were doing the things that Adam Smith says you should do, right, and getting an increasingly sophisticated division of labor, et cetera. Um, and of course, Smith himself never said that you know, if you do no, this. No, he didn't. Right? I mean, no, he, he didn't say technological change would follow from right. that. Can I just move this on a bit? Um, and ask you both, when do you think there is a very, very clear and discernible divergence between the East of China and Europe, or the best parts of China and the best parts of Europe, however we want to frame it uh, geographically? When does that actually occur? And why, if the Chinese were up on this, roughly on the same plateau, mm -hmm. do they not see that the West is moving to a peak that they could emulate import technology, learn from the West, and catch up much quicker than they have. So the catch up is long delayed, yes. isn't it? I mean, the Anglo-French comparison is, the point I was making is the catch up is not long delayed. Right. Uh, but one would say about, would, I don't know whether you'd say this, that the, the catch up for China, considering where it was in your vista in the mm. middle of the 18th century, has been long delayed. 
Is that something endogenous to China, which was already there before 1750 and implicit? Or is it something that happens after 1750, a series of endogenous or exogenous shocks, which holds the economy from really converging in the way that the French and the Germans converge on the English? In other words, why right. is the convergence so slow? Um, I would argue that it is, a ser it is a series of shocks, some of them, that they're both endogenous and exogenous, and that the, the nexus that really, where it all happens, is actually the intersection between the state and the environment. Yes. That in the early 19th century, or in some parts of China by the late 18th century, you're getting increasingly pressing ecological problems. The state is doing reasonably well for a pre-modern state at managing these things, but they are increasingly difficult. So for instance, the cost simply of keeping the Yellow River from flooding is over 10% of the entire Qing government budget by the early 19th century. Mm. It's a huge problem. But it has a very low budget, doesn't it? It does have Compared a... Compared with the West. I mean, the amount it manages to extract... Is small. For these to, to supply public right. goods, to converge, to deal with famines, right. riots, the Taipings, right. all of these things. The budget that it has it, looks to me, because I'm very interested yeah. in what you're saying about the state, the budget that it has to cope with these problems looks rather pathetic right. in Western eyes. And I think that's part, well, there are two things that are going on there that are important, I think, <clears throat> at least two. One is that the budget isn't quite as pathetic as it looks because the line between state and society is different. So a Qing magistrate who wants to see a bridge repaired, particularly in a re wealthy part of the country, doesn't tax people and then appropriate the money to build the bridge. He makes a symbolic donation that covers maybe 1 20th of the cost of the project and then essentially asks the local gentry to put up the rest. Mm -hmm. And he's largely able to do that. Now, there are certain things in it for the local gentry in doing this. This isn't purely something out of the goodness of their heart. Mm -hmm. But there's also a different relationship between state and society. Mm -hmm. um, right? You would have a very hard time in Western terms classifying that as either clearly public or clearly private right. spending. Mm -hmm. and so I think that's one thing, that the, the, the state isn't quite as pathetic as it looks because it can actually through moral suasion, leverage a whole bunch of extra money. Mm. But the second thing, and this is something that Bin Wang, who isn't in this conversation, but was certainly Would part like of to, this yeah. emerging um, field, has emphasized is that the Chinese state faces fundamentally different problems than the European states. Um, every European state from you know, at least the late 15th century on, looks across its borders and sees equals or near equals that it has to fight frequently. Oh, yes. And Indeed. perpetual warfare is a big deal, and the main security threat comes without, from without. And that involves you in this endless upward ratcheting of government spending, of creating a public debt, of creating all these instruments, which had the world ended in 1800, we might have said, my, those Europeans were so clever. They came up with all these really interesting ways to spend next year's revenue now, et cetera, et cetera. It's a shame they only used it to kill each other. Now then, of course, what happens in the 19th century is that they begin to use that fiscal power for a whole bunch of other things as well. Sure. And that's a huge difference. The Chinese state basically doesn't borrow. And yeah. part of the reason it doesn't borrow is it does not look across the border and see equals. Its main security threats are internal. Right? It's much more likely to be overthrown by rebellion than by invasion. Which it nearly was, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think another difference is uh, a different tradition. Um, Qing government, you know, some people see it's a ruling class of Qing is a Confucian fundamentalists. Mm 
they follow the Confucius principles very well. According to this principle, a good government, a good state, cannot uh, tax people more. Uh, so during the first two uh, centuries, the Qing government did not increase any uh, taxes. They did have the capacity, but they didn't. So, um, and the result, of course, you can see good or uh, bad. The, the good is uh, the ordinary people uh, could enjoy more their earning, but bad things, the state didn't have a big ability to produce the more public goods. Well, I want to thank you both very much. I think um, and I want to thank Ken for having written a great book and Lee for having provided so much of the really good data behind this wonderful thesis of divergence that has given what was 10 years ago a rather moribund profession in economic history something really big and global to talk about. Thank you both very much. Well, thank you. Thank you.